Wow, that works. <laughs> we are finishing up our series today on uh, this book that I've been reading called Christian Atheist by a pastor with, by the name of Craig Rochelle. Uh, and looking at some, some, I, some areas that we can identify in our lives that we may be saying to the world and saying for ourselves, knowing it or if we're not knowing it, that we believe in God but we don't really live as if He is alive and well. We, we don't really live that He exists. We, we say we believe there's a Creator, we say that we believe, we believe there's a God. And we've been looking over the past three weeks now, this is the fourth week, at some terms, starting with the letter T, uh, of Christianity, that we, we, as we look at Scripture, we have to understand that these terms, that, uh, labels that we, we give to these different people are not true Christianity. They are a manufactured Christianity. They are false Christianity. But first of all, it's cultural Christianity. We know God. Uh, we, we believe in God. We, we don't know Him, or we know Him. Or we know him, but we don't know him all that well. Or we know him intimately, and we serve him wholeheartedly. We talked about this being uh, three stages in our in our walk, and that everybody in the faith goes through. We start at a stage zero or stage one, where we we believe that there is a God, but we don't know who He is. And these are all perfectly okay. We all go through this. It is not a uh, a judgment to say that stage three is better. Stage three people are better than stage one or stage zero people. It is just the path that we're on. And we're all moving from stage zero, or we even know there was a God, to stage three. Okay? So stage one is that we, we kind of grasp that there is a creator. This is much too complex in the world. Uh, there's got to be somebody, but we have no clue who that even is. Okay? Uh, stage two is we believe in God and we know Him. So we can start calling Him names. Our Heavenly Father, we can talk about Jesus, we can talk about the Holy Spirit, but we don't really know them that well. Okay? We don't know them intimately. We don't know what makes them tick yet. We are beginning to. We're going on that journey to get to know them and to let them know us and have that, that relationship. Always stage three, where we have... Uh, a, an intimate relationship with God. We know His heartbeat. We are familiar with His Word. And we are living it out. We're serving God wholeheartedly. So stage one, uh, the first week we talked about the cultural Christianity, um, the, the Christmas and Easter Christian. People who go to church, they would say to the census takers, uh, yes, I am a Christian. I don't have a church. Uh, I would claim this church as my church because we go there on Christmas. Uh, but I'm not really familiar with all the church stuff. But I'm, I believe I'm a Christian because I believe in God. Okay. That was a cultural Christian. Then uh, the second week, we talked about customized Christianity, where we take what we like and what fits us, and the rest of it, we just push it to the side. We don't read those chapters or those verses in Scripture. Uh, we don't claim them because they make us not feel good. Okay? We call this customized Christianity, and at the heart of it, we talked about was uh, a lack of fear of God. Okay? And we said that fear was not the scary cat, I'm afraid that God's going to push me from the farm. Okay? We said the fear of God is the love for God and the respect for God. Love plus respect equals fear. Okay? So when we love and we respect who God is, we love God for who He is and what He's done for us and the relationship He has with us. And we respect His sovereignty, His authority. We understand He has great power, much greater than ours. We begin to have a fear of the Lord. Okay. And uh, because we don't like being fearful, none of us, humanity, we don't like being uh, fearful, we tend to customize our Christianity and we say, I'll believe these things, but these things can take the height. And it's a false Christianity that says, I can be this and call myself a Christian, but I don't have to be those things that Jesus says to do. Uh, we need to be all in or all out. The third week, we talked about cautious Christians. Uh, going from that fear, reverence of God, to a lukewarm Christianity. We don't really fear God all that much. So we have a lukewarm Christianity out Revelation chapter 3. And we're talking about um, the church of Laodicea. And Jesus saying, because you're neither hot, not all in, okay, you're not all in, you're not hot, 
and you're not cold, you're somewhere in the middle. I am about to a mako, the Greek word for spew or vomit. I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to take that part. I'm going to cast it out of my body. Okay. So the cautious Christian that doesn't offend, okay, if that doesn't uh, become a fanatic, and we're going to be words we don't want them to be our labels as Christians. We're not going to be uh, fundamentalists or fanatics or all those things. But uh, folks, we got to be God people. All in, sold out for God. Uh, if we are not. If we are lukewarm, we're kind of halfway. We're that cautious Christian or that customized Christian, that cultural Christian. Jesus says, uh, I'll get rid of it. I can't stand it. It is so bad, it makes me sick. No, I'll cast it out of the, out of the body. Uh, this is the final week we're talking about. Uh, I believe in God, but uh, maybe I don't. Just, I'm just having a hard time trusting Him. Does, does anybody have trust issues here? If you aren't raising your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> every single one of us has trust issues with somebody. We do. Because we've been burned. Every single one of us. Sometimes we have trust issues in the church. Okay? We went to a church and we got mistreated there. There was a group of people that didn't like us or made fun of us or whatever. Or maybe the pastor said something that uh, was mean uh, or we took it uh, mean or judgmental or whatever. We have trust issues with, with people in this world. We have trust issues in the church today. And because of that, we just have trust issues with God. And, and maybe if we don't know God fully, we think that in our trust issues that we believe He can't quite handle who we are. So we don't give Him anything. We can't trust Him with all that we are. And, and I'm here to tell you today, folks, uh, we've got to get over that. We have to get over this and begin trusting God. He is a great and mighty and awesome God. We have seen so many times, time and again, whether it's on our Facebook page, whether it's a testimony on our Sunday morning, or in one of our small groups, uh, whether it's been this summer, as we've seen God step up and answer our test a full time, and how much He has uh, poured out and, and revealed Himself to us, how much He has shown us. Our God is a trustworthy and faithful God, and we've got to get over these things about trusting Him. Uh, we have a problem trusting God, even when He is trying to give us something good. And I would say, if you have a problem trusting God with everything in your life, you're not alone. The vast majority of us, all of us, have a hard time trusting God with everything in our life. Okay, for one reason or another. And this is nothing new, i got to tell you. So in, in your notes this morning, uh, I just want to go over the scripture in Deuteronomy really fast. This is a long time ago, folks. The Israelites have been brought up out of Egypt. They are uh, brought up right to the, the brink of the promised land, okay? And then they are not allowed to go in, okay? It's Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. And it says this, uh, When the Lord uh, sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, he said, Go up and take possession of the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You did not trust him or obey him. You have been rebellious against the Lord ever since I have made you. That's a powerful thing. You have been rebellious against the Lord ever since I have known you. Father God, as we dig into your word this morning, we pray that your truth, by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, would just permeate us. That you would reveal to us yourself, uh, your desire for our life, that in this lesson, studying your word, God, you would transform our understanding of who you are. And that it would affect us, God. It would affect change in our life. That we would leave this place this morning with a different and new and fresh perspective on you and what we are to do as followers of you. We pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. So, this little thing, I, I, I say this trusting God issue is not a new thing. So the kids get out of Egypt, and, and this is pretty miraculous stuff, okay? We've gone over this before. All the plagues, everything, okay, that happened. Uh, God shows up in a big way. Uh, Passover happens, okay? And, and the kids are let go of Egypt, and they're coming up into the promised land. And it's not that, if you look at Google Maps, it's not that far of a journey, okay? It's like that far on Google Maps. <laughs> I'm telling you, Egypt, cross the side of Mithla, you're into the promised land, okay? They didn't have that far to go. This is not a 40-year journey. 
Okay? But they get all the way up there, right to Ganesh Barnea, then right at the base of the promised land. And what happened? Do you guys remember what happened in that story? Uh, they sent spies into the promised land. Twelve of them, one from each tribe. And the spies came back with a report. Oh man, this is the promised land. It is everything God said it would be. It's uh, flowing with milk and honey. And ten of the spies said, the people there are giants. We are mere grasshoppers to them. Okay? If we go there, surely the bad things are going to happen. And two, God would be one of them, said, guys, we got God. Okay? But the majority ruled, right? They did not trust God. They did not obey God. The majority ruled. So they wandered in the desert for 40 years. That's all an entire generation died. Right? And even when they get up to the promised land the second time, and Joshua is there, and Moses is up on the mountain looking out of the promised land, knowing he's not going not to go over to the promised land. When they cross the river finally, it's not because they were good kids. Okay? You remember, they're just like every other kid. Are we there yet? <laughs> Because they earned it. They're crossing the promise land because God is good. They're crossing the promise land because He promised it and then He, he let them have it. Okay? And, and they went into the promise land. Well, we believe in God, but I think a lot of us have a hard time trusting Him fully. Okay? We believe in God and have a hard time trusting Him fully. So this term we're looking at is controlling Christian. Anybody know controlling Christian? You don't have to raise your hand. This is one of those times when our youth group thing would be really great when you start pointing the fingers at somebody that point to point back at you when you volunteer somebody you're volunteering yourself, right? If, if you know a controlling Christian, if we are controlling Christians because we're control freaks, okay? Every single one of us. We want control in our life. Okay? What are some of the silly things that you try to control in your life? So just say that up. What are some of the silly things you try to control? Money. Family. Family? All right. Children. Yeah. 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 Maybe you don't consider children family, Lindsay? <laughs> Sometimes they don't. They haven't quite earned it yet. They're not part of the family yet. But if they're good, they're good. Yeah. Anybody have an issue controlling the TV in the No. Oh, God. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I hold on to it all the time. Okay. Both of them. I got all of them. Okay, they sit right here in a little pocket in my chair for them. Okay? We, we want the TV remote. Because we want to watch what we want to watch. We need the volume that we want it, right? We don't ever get into disagreements with our spouses and our kids about that remote. I loved it when I was a kid. I was the TV remote. My dad would say, Ryan, go change the channel. There was only three channels. Go change the channel. Nope, not that one. That was good. See that? I was the remote. And no one had to fight over me. My mom and dad equally said, I ain't going to change the channel or turn it to the TV or turn it back. But now, we try to control that thing. We try to have a little authority in our house, right? I, I don't know about you guys. We, Tanisha and I, we, we sometimes wrestle over the remote. <laughs> Are we fast forwarding the commercials quick enough? Because I don't want to see commercials. Yeah. So both of us, we get a little behind, you know. We're, you know, sit on the, on the arm of the couch in between us. And before you know it, somebody's grabbed it. Okay, we're back on the show. Okay. Or the, or the game that the Seahawks will win today. <laughs> Against the different problems. I'm just saying. <laughs> right, Papa Dear? Just saying. They need prayer. They need prayer, yeah. Uh, do you ever try to control who drives in your family? <laughs> My wife would say no. I mean, this is, yeah, for 17 years. 18 years we've been controlling his rights. Because neither one of us really like the other dragon. Okay. Okay. But my, my wife will tell you every time that she does not like right. Okay. But she sits right there. You all know what I'm talking about. Okay. The route we take, right? The temperature in our car. It's too cold. No, it's not. Not cold enough. Okay. When they came out with tri-zone temperature control, amazing. Okay. 
I didn't tell the point that he realized that there is no barrier between you and the fact that the next to you. So when they crank it up to 100 and you've got it at 60, it still leeches over. But we're still trying to control it, right? The radio station, what music you're listening to, we try to control everything. Where do you eat? Okay? We try to control it. The idea of control even blends into our spiritual life. And there are things that are so easy for us to give to God. God, I got cancer. I need you to take care of it. Boom. Okay? We give it over to God right away because we know that's a big thing. God's a big God. We just hand it over. But there are things that God's been talking to every one of us for years in our life about a certain area. And we're, we're like, not really God. That's, that's mine. Not so much. Okay? You can have this and this and this, but that's fine. I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to let go of it yet. I'll hold on to that for a little while. Okay. What, what we end up doing is we end up living a partially surrendered life instead of a fully surrendered life. When we hold back on God, we end up living a partially surrendered life. I want you to open up your Bible to Proverbs chapter 3 if you're not already there. It's in our, in our notes and on the screen. Proverbs chapter 3. This is a verse that man, so many Christians can recite from memory. It is, it is a verse that we hold on to so much. And it's so encouraging. Uh, it is that you give us a great viewpoint, but I would venture to say that when we read this as Christians, we don't often read it the way that it's written. Okay? I, 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 I just wonder if you follow along with me in your devices, on, in, your, in your Bible, on the screen. It says this Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now, there is an absolute right there, and I talk about absolutes all the time. All. That means everything. Okay? All. Now, when my kids use absolutes, I say this all the time. You can't use absolutes. There's only God who uses absolutes. And you've got to listen to what he does. Okay? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. So I think some of the time, some of us will say, I trust in the Lord with some of my heart. Okay, because you can't have that area right there. I'm not done being that. I don't know how many of let that go. But the scripture says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And we would say, but God, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through, God. And we not on your own understanding. On God's mind. On God's wisdom. On God's heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all, not some, not a little bit, not a few, not 99%, in all of your ways, acknowledge God. Acknowledge Him. And He, not you, not your spiritual advisor that you pay money to. Not even your pastor. Okay? Not, not anybody. He, God, will make your path straight. This verse, man, we read this, man, we, we, we'd be all in with God. And so many of us, we want to put in all those little things. Yeah, I trust God. In all, in all of my heart. But I bet if we just took a poll, every single person in this room has some part of their heart that is hurt, that is broken, that is a secret, that they think is a secret. We, we all have something that we just aren't willing to hand over to God for us. But God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Be not in your own understanding. It doesn't make sense to completely surrender to somebody that you can't even see. But be not on your own understanding. In all your ways, every single way, everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, everything you feel, in all your ways, acknowledge God, and He will make your path straight. I think a lot of us in the Christian world want to substitute this path. We want to put in, we want to take some of those absolutes out, and we just want to put our own wording in there to actually live with that. But that's not what God asks you to do. He asks you to do this. He puts the absolutes in for a reason. And he says, read this, live it, trust me in everything. I think a lot of us, we, we want to substitute words in the past. We don't want to read it the way it's really written. And maybe so many other verses in Scripture, we don't want to read what it really says. We want to read what we think it says to make ourselves look better. We, we don't want to be corrected by Scripture because that hurts sometimes. But so it's on the other side of that, he's made the path straight. you got a messed up life. 
you see some obstacle after obstacle, trust in the Lord. It's all of it. Like you're not on your own to begin. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. I think it's like we're saying to God, if we could just be honest with ourselves, we're saying to God and to each other, I'll give God some things, but not everything. I'll give God some things. I'll give God, I'll be honest, I'll give God all the stuff that I talk about in church with all my Bible study friends and with all my Christian friends, but my Bible study friends, my Christian friends don't know anything from my life. So I don't have to give that part to God. So maybe a that's what we do. We hold on to it. That's not trusting God in all of our ways. It's like we say, I'll give you God, I'll give you an hour for church. That trying is changing, by the way. It used to be, I'll give you Sunday for church, God. Okay, all day, all night, all afternoon. Okay. We will stay at church, we will listen to testimonies, the pastor will speak for four hours. Right? And now it's, it's smaller and smaller and smaller. We face today as pastors, we face uh, lots of fun discussions with, with ourselves. We have uh, social media groups that we use to encourage each other. That are private. You have to be clergy to be part of them. You have to prove that you're clergy because we talk about stuff that's on our heart. We want to make sure that it's confident, it's confident, it's confident, it's okay. And, and we talk about things like how, how long is your sermon? Why should pastors care how long the sermon is if Jesus is being preached? We care because our people leave because we talk too long. <laughs> I'm just telling you. They want to get to lunch. Okay? I'm going to call you out, Larry. Larry's looking at his watch. He's, he's making fun of me. Okay? Anymore, because we have so many churches, folks, and because theology is muddy. Don't know what they're what they're learning when they go into a church. They base the church that they go to based on how long the service is, how great the band is. Do they have a coffee shop? Where I can get a drink at the coffee and I can stop on the way? Do they have lights? Do they have you know, all these things? But a lot of it is, man, they say, we got books telling our pastors, if you preach longer than 15 minutes, your your church won't we'll follow you because their minds are now on social media and they can't focus on anything longer than 10 minutes. And if you're 15 minutes, you've done five minutes over, and you need to wrap it up. But the Word of God, folks, it has got to be spoken. It has to be shared. It has to be. It has to shape our lives. I'll give God, I'll give you an hour for church. But man, all those extra days that the pastor wants, and the teachers want, and they want us to go to Bible study, and they want us to go to youth group, and they want us to go to quiz group, and they want us to go to everything. God, I only got an hour. I'm only going to give you an hour, God. I'll give you some of the parts of my life, but not all of it. I cannot commit to that much in my life. I'll give you five minutes in the morning. Pastor said, the first of my day. Talk about not just money, not our first fruits, but the first fruits is everything, all we are, the best part. So the first fruits of our day, I'll give you five minutes. That's all I got, Pastor, because I got a busy schedule. Five minutes of my day, and I'll give it to you. But my money and my stuff is mine. Let me barter and negotiate with God. We'll give some of the stuff to God, but we won't give him everything. We don't trust him with everything. So we, we, we got to hold on to something. We have some sort of symbols of control in our life, even as Christians. I trust you with my salvation, God. But my kids, my job, my free time, that's my time. Okay? I don't trust you with those. I need to direct those. I I'm worried about things, God, so I will pray about them. I will give them to you. But if you take too long, God, I'm going to take it back. You ever do that? <coughs> There's some people that need to raise their hand. <laughs> You've been praying about something, and you say, God is not answering me, and you just hold on to it forever. I have counseled a lot of people. I've been praying about this for weeks, for months. Well, maybe if you tied your fingers off of it, and you let it go to God, he would be. Well, but we got to hold on to it. You say, God's taking forever, I'm taking it back. Okay? We give some stuff, but not everything. We want to trust you with everything, God, but I can't do it, right? Because we're control freaks. We have to have some sort of order and control in our life. We have to be in charge of something, right? Right? I 
know you. You know me. We gotta be in charge of something, right? God has a purpose for everyone. You, me, everybody. And that means everyone. The thing is that if we hold back on God, if, if we don't give him the stuff that's the obstacles in our life, if we don't give him, fully surrender to him, the stuff that has been holding us back, weighing us down, if we don't trust him, we won't experience the fullness of what God has prepared for every single one of us. He has a plan for every one of us. He has a life full of joy mapped out for every single person, every human. We will stay at stage zero. Not even knowing there is a God. Or stage one. We know there's a God, we just don't know Him. We'll stay there for a long time, folks. If we can't trust God, but I'll tell you, if we trust God, if we hand that stuff over, you will not believe how quickly you get to know God and how quickly you move through the stages and how amazing your life will be. We're not meant to stay at stage zero or stage one. God did not design us that way. I want you to think of, of Peter. When Jesus is on the sea, he calls Peter out into the water. Uh, Peter gets out of the boat, okay? Think about Peter. Jesus is there, he's in the storm, the waves are crashing around, the disciples are in the boat, he calls Peter out, Peter doesn't say, no, wait a minute, Jesus. Peter, being the guy that I adore so much, he doesn't think often before he acts. See, Peter didn't mess up this invitation by thinking about it. He just obeyed it. He did it. Peter walks out onto the water. We sang that song today for a reason, folks. Peter walks out onto the water. He gets out of the boat. He trusts Jesus when Jesus says, come. Okay? And he goes. He trusts Jesus. We read that, and we say, God, I want this miraculous life. I want to experience your power. I want to know that you are real. But I'm too freaked out to get out of the boat. I like the boat. It's safe. Some of you are probably saying, I've been on a boat before, it's not very safe. It moves around all the time, I'm out of control, I get sick. I don't even want to go in the boat. I'll just stand on shore. But God's calling us out of the water. Jesus is calling us to trust Him, to step out. Most of us say, I want to walk on water, but I'm not getting out of the boat. And folks, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. You gotta try. You gotta step out. And Jesus says, come. Now, if you struggle with this, you're not alone. And I gotta let you know you're never alone in your faith struggle. There are people all over this world going through the exact same thing that you're going through right now as you struggle with faith and trust in God. And there are people who have gone through it before you for eons. Okay? You're not alone. This is part of our journey. If you are struggling in your trust of God, you are not alone. In Mark chapter 9, verse 22, we have a dad who brings his son to Jesus to be healed. His son was possessed by a demon. And the disciples would try to cast out this demon, but they were unable to do it. Okay? Jesus was busy. He's up on the mountain, transfiguring. He's coming down after spending some time with God. Okay? He comes into this mess, this chaotic scene of a crowd with a dad and a son who's possessed by a demon, and, and the disciples prayed over him, and it didn't work. They didn't, couldn't get the demon out. And this is what the dad says in Mark chapter 9, verse 23 through 24. He says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says, if you can? Can you imagine Jesus standing there going, if? Really? you got to ask me, if I can? If you can, if I can, so everything is possible for one who believes. More absolute from the Son of God. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the bottom of the boy's father explained, I do believe. 
help me overcome my unbelief. Now, some of us would say, that doesn't make sense. If he believes, he doesn't have any unbelief. But if you think about it for a second, every single one of us believes in and has unbelief at the same time. We believe in a God. We've seen him work. We've seen him work in this church. But at the same time, we also come up with this stuff that we're facing in our life, and we have doubt. We have unbelief about it. If, if you're struggling in this area, you are not alone. People from the time of Jesus to now have struggled with believing and still unbelieving. Even the dad still concerned over his son. This passage gives us permission to believe in God and yet to ask God to help us where we struggle. This passage should be a huge encouragement to every one of us. Jesus, I believe. Help me in the areas where I'm struggling to believe. Help me in the areas where I'm struggling to trust you. Help me in the areas where I'm holding on with all that I am and I need to just let go. I believe in you. Would you help me with my unbelief? So right now we're going to get honest with ourselves. Every one of you has a bulletin. You got your, your notes thing. And there is a statement on the bottom of the first page of the notes. It has a, a big empty area. Okay? And, and it says this. Every one of us is struggling with trusting God and at least one area of our life. I know this because none of us are perfect. We, we don't talk about it because we don't want other Christians to know we struggle with trusting God or fully surrendering. So I wonder if you can write it out. Could you just take a step and instead of me calling you up on the platform so you can share with everybody the area that you're struggling with, could you just write it on a piece of paper? Okay. I don't fully trust God with, to, whatever it is, okay? Why don't you think about it for a moment? I'm, a, I'm not fully trusting God in this area of my life. Maybe it's with my kids. I want to protect my kids so badly. I don't want them to leave. I want them to, if they go to college, I know the staff of God, man. If they go to college, they're going to lose their faith. They're going to be part of this world. They're going to come back to church. I don't trust you with them, God. Maybe you say, yeah, maybe you'd say, I don't trust God to forgive all of me. I hold not the pain in my life. It's the sin in my life. And I just don't think I'm good enough for God to, to forgive that part. And I don't trust God that he is able and capable to. Uh, maybe it's, I don't trust God to protect me me, or I don't trust God to hand over all my finances to him. Not just the 10%, but everything. I, I don't trust God to hand over my financial situation to him. I don't trust God to do what's best for me or to, to guide me in the direction I really think I need to be so I can confident in my life. What is it that you would say <laughs> that you are struggling with right now, an area of trusting God, what's holding you back from full surrender? I wonder if today, instead of blurting it out, if you would just have the courage to write it down on that piece of paper. It's the first step. Writing it down. It's the first step to developing a, a wholehearted trust. We, we talked about stage three is knowing God intimately and serving Him wholeheartedly, trusting Him with everything that we are, and, and just living it out, serving Him. So this is the first step to developing a wholehearted trust and, and serving him wholeheartedly. So write it down. It's the first part of your assignment today. Write down whatever it is, something that's not just 100% given over to God. Okay. So how, how do we develop a wholehearted trust? And I think we, we look back at the verse that we had today uh, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will make the path straight. Uh, I think the beginning of the journey of developing a wholehearted trust of God is just those two verses. Can we just work on those two verses? Because those absolutes in there are huge. How do I develop a wholehearted trust of God? I trust Him with all my so you have a discussion with God saying, what does that look like? What am I holding back from you? What part of my heart is in me? Have I not handed over to you? Lean not on your own understanding. God, would you reveal your wisdom to me? 
As I read through the scripture, would you help me not to read it for me, but would you teach me? Would you train me? Would you uh, pour your heart into me so I know your heart and your will, not me trying to fix scripture in my own way? Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge God. God, would you empower me to give you thanks? And all I do to remember who you are, your sovereignty, your authority in my life. And then I'll kick back. And you will make my path straight. My path will be so much easier if I do these things with you. This is the beginning of developing a wholehearted trust. To apply the scripture to our lives, you have to understand the heart of the scripture. To me, that, that most important word in the whole passage uh, is one that I think most of us struggle with, and that's acknowledging God in, in everything. And acknowledging Him. In all our ways, acknowledge God. In all your ways, submit to God. Some of the translations say, in all your ways, submit to Him. Uh, in everything you do, know your place and His place. God will make you pl- uh, straight. So, uh, it, it's really interesting. I look, I look at the heart of that. And I can't trust God unless I acknowledge He is. And all the things that I'm doing, that He is the power, He is the authority, He is the sovereign God. Okay. So when we look at the Hebrew of this, this is a really cool thing. The Hebrew word for acknowledge is God. Now, this word Yada has a lot of different meanings depending on the context, which is one of those wonderful things about Hebrew. Okay? But in this context, it's Yada. You know when someone when, when, when someone's talking to you and it just sounds like a lot of the and you got yada yada yada. Okay? That's a Jewish phrase. Because yada yada, okay, is pointless talk. That's the translation of it, okay? So you learn something today from ancient Hebrew. Yada yada is different than yada, okay? Yada is knowledge in God. So it says yada means coming to know and submit by observing, reflecting, and experiencing, okay? Yada yada, the double, means pointless talk. Okay? Yada yada yada, different. But Yah means coming to know and submit by observing, reflecting, and experiencing. Well, one of the things I, I love to do when I learn uh, Greek words or Hebrew words or whatever is put them in Scripture where the, whatever that word actually is and then just read it that way. And boy, does this make a difference in the past we've ever read. In all of your ways, come to know and submit by observing and reflecting and experiencing Christ. And He will make your path straight. I mean, just, so we just take the, the, the definition and we put it in there for acknowledge. In all your ways, come to know and submit by observing and reflecting and experiencing Christ. And he will make your path straight. Yada isn't intellectual knowledge. It's intimate knowledge. It's knowing someone's heart. It is knowing to the full. Okay? It's experiential knowledge. It adds by the more that we do, okay? The more that we experience, we gain more knowledge. The more we experience Christ, the more we observe Him and submit to Him and, and relate with Him, the more we know Him. So before He makes your path straight, God wants you to yada Him, to know Him, to submit. Okay, I'll say that in just a second. Submit, observe, reflect, and experience. And then he makes your path straight. This is the beginning of developing a wholehearted trust of God. We can trust someone when we know them to the full. We don't know them very well, so we have to trust them, right? We don't know their heart, we don't know their motivations or intentions. Super hard to trust somebody. I think the, the fun part of this is when we understand that. In our humanness, we want God to prove himself to us so that we can trust him. Okay? We want God to prove himself to us so that we can trust him. You get that? Have you lived that? I know I have. God wants to be done for me later. You know, if I'm asking God for something in prayer and it doesn't happen the way I think it should, then my prayer life kind of falters a little bit because He didn't give me what I want. 
he hasn't proven himself to me, so I can't really trust him. He's not going to answer me and he's not going to give me what I want. But we want God to prove himself so that we can trust him, but we have a, a, we have a bathroom. We say, God, if you'll do this, I will do that. If then. Okay? Uh, the first one that came to my mind as I was going over this sermon is one of my favorite movies is Unbroken. Mm -hmm. The story of uh, Louis Zamperini in World War II uh, was imprisoned by the Japanese. And while he was floating in that he cried out to God and said, God, you can save me from this. Then I will do this. I'll, I'll follow that. He did save them, and it took a few years for him to figure out that he still had her. That's the statement. God, if you'll prove yourself to me, then I'll open myself to you. God, I, I, I want to tie. I want, to, I want to do the whole five like we've been talking about. So I need you to show me the money so I can show you the money. Okay? <laughs> so if I'm going to tie, you better increase my income so I can tie what we say in the new tie because right now I don't have what we say in the tie. So if you show me the money, I'll show you the money. I think you get what I'm saying. We, we want God to prove himself so that we can trust him. But we have it backwards. The truth is God wants us to trust him so that we, he can prove himself. God wants us to trust him first. Faith comes first. Okay? It is impossible to please God without faith. Okay? It's impossible to please God if we have zero faith in God or no faith in God. And I think it just comes right back around full circle. One of the reasons we have a hard time trusting God is we don't know God. We don't trust Him because we just don't know Him. We're still on stage one. We're stuck because we've got it backwards. We're waiting for God to prove Himself so that we can trust Him. And God is saying, I'm right here. Would you trust me? And then I'll show you. I mean, in our in our whole wonderful path of God, in our time this, this uh, past summer, was... If we would test God first, then and he would open the floodgates of heaven, right? In response. And he's doing that. It's not, I will open the floodgates of heaven so that you can test him. The worth of it, you're not testing him. God, the truth is God wants us to trust him, have faith in him, so he can reveal himself to us. So he can prove himself to us that he is trustworthy, that he is faithful. He is more faithful than anyone on this earth ever could be, ever will be. More trustworthy. So too many of us, too many of us are, are like an Impala, and I don't mean a Chevy Impala. When I looked for Impala for this picture, okay, I did a Google search, an image search, and I just wrote Impala. And I got 4,000 pictures of Chevy and Paul. Before I got one picture of an Impala. This is the Impala I'm talking about, okay? Too many of us as Christians are like this. Now, an Impala can jump 10 feet high, okay? Look at these split, no issue whatsoever. And at speed, because Impalas are fast, at speed, an Impala, if it jumps when it leaves the ground, can span 30 feet before its feet touch the ground again. But if you go to the zoo, you will notice that an Impala stands behind a wall this tall. It doesn't make much sense. Okay? Now, from perspective, the Impala is usually a little lower than you are. And because of that, the little three-foot wall that is behind the Impala won't jump where it can't see. It has trust issues. Can jump 10 feet high. Can jump 30 feet at speed, but it will not jump at all if it can't see where it's going to land. Hence, we get the great pleasure of watching Impala without any chain link fence or anything because they don't trust themselves. Too many of us as Christians work for life with Impala. If we can't see where we're going to land, if we can't see what God's got planned up for us, we just got, we're going to stand. We're going to stand right in that enclosure. We're going to sit right there for the rest of our life. 
It's not that we're incapable. We have all the capability in the world, designed in us by God. But if we don't trust God, when He says, Come out into the water, if we don't trust God, if He says, Jump over that little wall, you could probably step over it. Okay? Too many of us are like this in Paul. Don't be an Impala. Repeat it. Okay? Take a step of faith. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out. If you want to live a miraculous life, surrounded by the power of God, you can go where he says go. And if that's out of the boat, out of the water, into an unknown future, an unseen landing spot, you go. You trust. You have, you have faith. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. And maybe this is your chance to walk on water. So, today, We've already identified one area in your life that you're having some trust issues with God. Maybe this is your chance to walk on water. To trust God with that, with that issue and then to take a lead. Because Jesus is calling. And we believe he is. He's asking to come out on the water. He's saying it. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. I don't know about you guys, but I got borders on my trust. I've been burned too many times. But I will also be clear to you that Jesus has never burned me. God has never burned me. I still got trust issues. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water wherever you would call me. These are the declaration. If you sang this song, if you were thinking in your head as you were reading it on the screen, boy, it is a declaration of God. And it is a dangerous declaration, folks. Asking the Holy Spirit to lead you to where your trust has zero borders, where you will leap without knowing when you're going to land. Powerful stuff. Where you would do miraculous things like walk on water because you have faith and trust in Jesus. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. When you say to God, take me deeper then I'm willing to go. He will. If you let him. He'll walk right there with you. Don't be an Apollo. Be Peter. Be you. Trust Jesus. Whatever you're holding back, whatever you wrote on the line in your notes, you've got to give it to God. When you do, you'll get to know God, and you'll end up leaping from stage zero to stage one to stage two to stage three. An intimate relationship with God, serving Him wholeheartedly. The rewards are priceless, joy, unspeakable joy, a passion for life, because you're where God has you designed to be. You're accomplishing everything you were designed for. So, in the next 24 hours, you have a challenge. If what you wrote or that thought that entered your mind when I asked about the trust issues we have. You have a challenge in the next 24 hours to take a step on whatever you wrote, whatever that is, that line where you say, I'm having a hard time trusting God with this. You have 24 hours to get out of the boat and out of the water. And, and that's for you and God to figure out what that means. Maybe it means for the first time ever in your life, you will vocalize that trust issue to somebody. And you will say, I desperately need you to walk with me on this, to pray for me, to encourage me, to hold me up, because I've been holding back way too long. Maybe it is uh, getting rid of something physical. I mean, if you got issues, man, God, I, I have issues with spending time with you, because I love watching TV too much. So maybe you give it to the TV. <gasps> Yeah, maybe you get rid of a TV. If you say, man, God, I just have so many issues in my life uh, with relationships, and it's because of this smartphone or this tablet that I hold in my hand, God, would you help me with that? Maybe if you get rid of your smartphone, you go to a dumb phone. <laughs> I'm serious. I will tell you, they still make flip phones. <laughs> okay. I, almost every week, Rich and I have a discussion about the happiness that he has in his life because he's not bogged down 
with all the information that that smartphone brings in at the touch of a button. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's kind of asking you to just get rid of something. This is something that's a barrier to your relationship with him, and he's calling you out, and you just keep holding on to this thing. Okay? So 24 hours to take a step out of the boat. Whatever it is, you pray to God. You say, God, I wrote it down. I, I thought in my head, I've got this thing that I'm having some trust issues with you. Well, what would it be? What would it look like for me to step out of the boat in the next day? Before the close of business on Monday. In 24 hours, tell someone where you struggle. Tell them you don't trust God. Whatever you wrote down, have them help you and pray for you. That's the discipleship. By the way, when you entrust somebody with something and you ask them to speak back into your life, when you do this, when you get it out in the open and you hand it over to God, you get to know God better. When whatever is holding you back is no longer holding you back, you get to know God better. It's amazing. So I want to leave you with this last verse that will help us to get out of stage zero, out of stage one of this Christian atheist life because hidden in this verse is, uh, I think, the key to slaying or getting rid of, killing off the Christian atheist that is in all of us. That uh, a lazy faith that says, I don't believe in God, I just don't live like he's real. It, it comes out of Psalm 100. And it says this, Psalm 100, verse 3 through 5, Know that the Lord is God. Know it in your bones. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And here's the key hidden inside of this. In the Old Testament, sheep were only brought through the gate into the city once a year. And for only one purpose, folks. To be sacrificed. It was one time of year, and the purpose was for the sheep to walk into the city to provide a sacrifice for their human owners to God. The Bible says if we are his sheep and we're to enter the gates with thanksgiving and enter his court with praise, we are the sheep of his pasture. Well, that brings a whole different meaning in, doesn't it? The sheep enter the gate to be sacrificed. And sacrifice doesn't sound entirely enjoyable. So why are you thankful for that? But this is the key to slaying the, the Christian meat is the lazy Christian within each of us. Because when we yada God, when we know God, by experiencing Him. Our life becomes a living sacrifice. Every part of us laid out before the King. Nothing is off limits. There's no holding back to anything. You will get to know the goodness of God. You will get to know the love of God and the enduring faithfulness of God. And you sacrifice off the old self. He says, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross daily. Kill yourself. Kill the old self. Get rid of it. Fall after The old is gone. The new is here. So if we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, whatever it is that you have a hard time letting go of, you can trust him with it far more than you can ever trust yourself. Far more than you can ever trust anybody here on earth. So it's time to move past the next family. It's time to enter his gate. As a sheep, he's the shepherd. To kill off the self, the old self. It's time to move from lazy Christian atheism into true Christianity. It's time to move from, I believe in God, but I don't live like he's real, 
to, I believe in God, and I know that He is real. It's time to move away from, I believe in God, but I don't really know Him or fear Him. I'm not going to be a fanatic or a zealot about Him. I, I don't trust Him completely, but I believe that He's there. It's time to move from that to moving to a full and true Christian lifestyle, a righteous lifestyle that says, I respect God because of who He is. I have a healthy fear. I don't want Him to squish me. But I respect his sovereignty. He is Lord, Master, King. All these things. He has great power and good. I know he won't because he loves me. I'm going to respect I'm going to be passionate about God. Because the one thing Jesus is asking me to do is to make disciples in this world. To teach them what he has taught me. To baptize them. Okay? I have a purpose. We have a purpose here on earth. It is so that God will be made known that the kingdom will grow. So I'm going to be passionate about it. And I'm going to trust God. True Christianity. Trusts God with all that we are so that we can know Him better. There's a point to all this, folks. To know God and to make Him known. To be Jesus with CNR in this community. So these are your challenges. You've written something down. You've thought it in your head. Something that you are having issues trusting God with. And your challenge now this week, and I'm not giving you a whole week, I'm giving you 24 hours. Take a step out of the boat. And, and, and some of us, I, I think, we say, man, i got 27 things. Great. Just start with one. Hand it over. You'll find it easier and easier as you go. Okay? Just start with one. And some of us, man, I've been, I've been with God. We're like this. We're tight. I don't have anything. Maybe. Maybe if you just ask God, he'll say, well, there's this one thing. And if there is, would you be willing to hand it over? 24 hours to step out of the boat. To voice it. To make it known. To a spouse. To a accountability partner. To someone that you trust here on earth so that you can really begin to trust God. When we come back next week, I hope we have stories to share. Stories about what God has done this past week. What He is about to do. You're so excited about that. That's the about a great God. Because He is. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to read your word, to have it permeate us. We pray again, God, that your word would change us transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ here on earth, God, that people that we come into contact would know you because we know you. So that is our challenge, to get to know you better, God, and to make you known. In order to make you known, we got to know you better. So we pray that you would reveal yourself to us in a very powerful way this week. Wherever we are at on the scale, God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would encourage us, that we would uh, move in the journey towards a more intimate knowledge of you, uh, towards more active service for you and with you. And all along the way, in this challenge we have, God, some of us may have a list a mile long about the things that we are having a hard time trusting you with. And, and we pray, God, would you just help us start with one and step out the boat before tomorrow or uh, up until tomorrow, God? And for those of us who are so close with you, God, we, we really are in, in step with you. If there is anything, God, that is hindering us from a full surrender to you, would you reveal it to us? Reveal it to us in our prayer life with you. Reveal it to us by uh, a friend or a co-worker. Anything, but God, please reveal it to us because we do not want anything holding us back from a life with you. We are ready, God, to step out of the walk our water to live a victorious life, to, to be in a miraculous, life-giving ministry. And we believe you're the one that makes it happen. So we hand it over to you. Move in us, God, so that you may be not made known. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You're dismissed, folks. Have a wonderful day. And don't forget about your channel.